Thank you, members. And uh, consideration stages of the Welfare Reform Bill. I call the Minister for Social Development, Mr. Mervyn Storty, to move the bill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the consideration stage of the Welfare Reform Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Members will have a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. Uh, just a short explanation. There are five groups of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in each group in turn. The first debate will be on Group 1, which contains 23 amendments and oppositions to two clauses stand part. This group deals with duties on the department, administration and assessments. The second debate will be on Group 2, which contains 14 amendments and opposition to nine clauses stand part. This group deals with entitlements. The third debate will be on Group 3, which contains seven amendments and opposition to six clauses stand part. This group deals with sanctions. The fourth debate will be on Group 4, which contains eight amendments. This group deals with reports, reviews, pilot schemes and information sharing. The fifth debate will be on Group 5, which contains 26 amendments. This group deals with assembly control, commencement and technical issues. Valid petitions of concern have been tabled in relation to amendments 1 to 13, 15 to 22, 24, 26 to 29, 36 to 45, 48 to 50, 53 to 57 and 73 to 75. Each will therefore require a cross-community vote. I would remind members intending to speak during the debates on the five groups of amendments they should address all of the amendments in each group on which they wish to comment. <coughs> Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and questions on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill, and if that is clear, we shall proceed. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 1 to 3. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question to stand part. No objections. The question is that clauses 1 to 3 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. We now come to the first group of amendments for debate, which contains 23 amendments and opposition to two clauses. These amendments deal with duties on the Department, Administration and Assessments, and include amendments such as the claimant commitment, frequency of payment and taking account of relevant medical evidence. Members will note that Amendment 1 is mutually exclusive to Amendment 3. Amendment 13 is consequential to Amendment 12. Amendment 18 and 19 are mutually exclusive, and Amendment 35 and 36 are also mutually exclusive. Amendment 39 is consequential to Amendment 38, and Amendment 57 is consequential to Amendment 10 and Amendment 37. Members will note that valid petitions of concern have been received in relation to Amendments 1, 3 and 4, 8 to 13, 17 to 19, 36 to 39, 43 to 45, 53, 57 and 74. Therefore, they will require cross-community support. I call Mr Roy Beggs to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Mr Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to formally move Amendment No. 1 and will then address the other uh, uh, issues in the group. Amendment 1 is in the name of myself and my colleague Robin Swan. I welcome this long overdue opportunity to open the debate on this, the next stage of the Welfare Reform Bill. It has been most contentious, the most drawn out, and yet probably the most important piece of legislation that this Assembly ha has ever considered. To date, we have had uh, about £100 million worth of fines imposed upon us, reductions in the in block grant. That has meant £100 million in terms of reduction in public services. There have been clawbacks during uh, this financial year, mid-year, mid uh, and indeed, I suspect, has contributed to lack of funding that would have been available to help. In 2015, £114 million would have been set aside uh, as potential fines again from the block grant. 
However, you would not think today is as important as it really is by uh, observing the shameful actions of the DUP last night, enabling multiple copies of their pre-prepared petitions of concern against every single amendment that has been put other than by their minister. They have effectively killed off discussion and the decision-making process in this assembly. Disgraceful. They are attempting to steamroll the bill through in their eyes and as they would wish it to be, and they are attempting to prevent this assembly from having its say. They have single-handedly uh, potentially blocked almost 50 amendments, including well over 20 in this group alone. This, I wish to continue. I may give way later on. Uh, there is nothing that can be argued about what I have said there. It's very factual. They have displayed undemocratic nature of their attitudes as MLAs and undemocratic nature of their party, which of course has the word democracy in their name. I and mean, of course the other uh, uh, country that springs to mind uh, uh, with, with the word uh, democratic in their name was, was at one time East Germany, the Democratic Republic of, of, of East Germany, which of course was a totalitarian state. And it would appear that the DUP uh, are, are much more in akin with, with that attitude than that of normal Western society. That unfortunately sums up how they approached the whole issue of welfare reform. Not embarrassed enough about how they tried to bring a copy of the uh, bring a copy of the uh, and paste of the GB bill across the Northern Ireland. They now uh, apparently have no shame in preventing what limited amendments could have been made to the bill uh, on, by this assembly, and their mechanism is making it virtually impossible for amendments to succeed. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, uh, an explanation, a shameful explanation from those DUP members who presumably all signed it and all have a responsibility in how they have uh, effectively removed the democratic, more normal working of this assembly. Why should we not have the ability to debate the bill, the individual cause, the clauses? and to make amendments. It appears to be their way or no way. After two years of sitting in an abyss, after months of detailed committee scrutiny on the proposals, proposals, after huge level of engagement from organisations that deal with welfare issues on a day-to-day -day basis, the DUP have decided that they know best. They appear to have their ears closed, certainly to other assembly members here and this debate. No amendment is seemingly good enough for them, as they think they have the right to step in to, and determine what uh, can and cannot be changed in the bill. I wish to proceed. I, wish, I, wish to, I will I'll give way later on. Of course, however, I do have to ask if this petition. I obviously have touched the. Order, 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 I, order. All remarks should be addressed through the Speaker. And if uh, the member wishes not to take interventions, that should be accepted by all the members because everyone, there is no restrictions on the debate, none at all. So everyone will have their opportunity here to make a contribution. Can we have some assistance from the, the chair? When a, a person who is uh, speaking in this house also has the title of being a deputy speaker, is it right that he shows such uh, inane inability to understand the rules of this House that he would seek to mislead the House into believing that they don't have the right to put down amendments, they don't have the right to vote on those amendments, and that anyone who puts down a petition of concern can decide which way they vote on any amendment? Well, I have a point of order. To respond to. The point that I made in my earlier intervention I think should provide the guidance. There is no restriction in debate. There is no restriction in people's ability to contribute to the debate. There were opportunities quite clearly for all parties and all members who put down amendments if they so wish. And there was reference made I think in some of the, uh, the opening remarks about uh, 
discussion being prevented on clauses. There is no such restrictions. Can I make that clear? And if members are prepared, they just kind of wait their turn and they will be called if they so indicate. And let's have a measured debate. There is no point in, uh, in starting cross-chatting. And you know, the election isn't for several months. So let's deal with this very important piece of legislation. Second point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I heard the member for East Belfast correctly, there was an accusation that Mr. Beggs was misleading the House. Would you review that, please? Well, my advice goes, let's not get into words, because I could have challenged some of the, uh, the earlier comments, decided not to. I do think it's entirely, you know, if someone is a Deputy Speaker, they're still entitled to be uh, a member and to act like a member and to contribute on behalf of themselves and their party, and that's exactly what is happening. Mr. Roy Beggs will be a contributor to this debate. He will not proceed over any aspect of this debate. Your point about the language that is used, I would just give that as a general health warning to every contributor. But some of the opening remarks could have had the effect, perhaps completely unintended, uh, that some aspects of this bill are not up for discussion at all. Every aspect of it is, and every member will have an equal opportunity, if they so wish, and if they do decide not to, that is their decision. It will not be the Speaker which will prevent that level of uh, contribution or discussion. Can we resume the debate, Mr. Biggs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I obviously touched a very raw nerve there. Uh, certainly, I, I would have thought that what is happening is, is rather than uh, perhaps being the, the normal warfare across the benches, is, is there a bit of a tag team happening? I, I would put that uh, for others to, to consider. Uh, uh, is there actually this tag team working in unison? Some put the petition the concern down, both voting their separate ways, knowing, knowing the net result that will occur, knowing that some may be able to express their opinion and yet prevent the, the amendments going through. So I would, I would simply ask members to watch the rest of this uh, debate today, listen carefully to what everybody says, watch how people vote and watch the net effect of the petition of concern that has been signed uh, by, I understand, that every member of, of the, the DUP Assembly Party. Um, I am more surprised to see, um, in terms of the, the, uh, the amendments that are being presented in, in this group, uh, perhaps some of the amendments that are not there. One would have thought that uh, uh, others who had uh, made very vocal their comments some time ago might have put something down. Would it I've actually given you a considerable amount of, of laxity here to set the context. But you should not attempt to kind of go back over the process. We are where we are. There's an order paper in front of us. There's a bill folder which we've all had access to. And, you know, I am waiting on you to start to address the amendments that are actually down, not the amendments that aren't there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I was just coming to that next section of, of, of my comments. Uh, the Ulster Unionist Party tabled our initial set of amendments almost two years ago. This is not something that we have thought on lightly or have suddenly determined that we would take action on, but we saw difficulties in what was being proposed by the Minister some years ago, and in this particular group we have put down amendments 1, 8, 18 and 35. Uh, you, you find that some of those initial points that we had made uh, two years ago, issues still remain to be addressed. Members will probably uh, not be surprised to see us raising these issues in the group. Um, uh, these are issues that we have, uh, for, for months, for years, been highlighting as being our concern. I would like, firstly, to deal with uh, Amendment Number One, uh, Joint Claims. The uh, coalition government's policy is that couples living in the same household will make a joint claim for their benefit, and I can accept the rationale of a uh, claimant commitment. Uh, we agree that in order to receive universal credit, a person should have to sign a pledge laying out exactly what uh, is expected of them and in return uh, uh, what benefits and support will be provided. However, it was a mistake in the, in the draft policy that if one member of a household failed for whatever reason to sign their commitment, that the rest of the household should be penalised for it and potentially no benefit entitlements coming into that household whatsoever as a result of a failure of one individual. Why should a family, perhaps with 
uh, a number of, of dependent children be left without support just because one of their parents failed to meet their commitments. Unfortunately, there will be households where this uh, uh, could happen. An adult, a parent, a partner failing may put their own needs ahead of others, but surely their partner and children should not suffer. We must protect the most vulnerable from debt and the possibility of homelessness, and those are issues which would virtually automatically follow if there was a complete end of, of uh, uh, support and, and benefits available to that whole household. Debt would gather, uh, perhaps uh, housing costs would mount, the possibility of landlords at some point in the future causing eviction. So we feel, yes I will. Would member accept that as the, regular, as the, the, the um, law stands and as the, 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 the bill will uh, support, that where someone is incapable of making that commitment, provisions already made for them. And does he recognise that the difficulty with his amendment is that it opens the door for those who choose, under the shelter of his amendment, not to make any commitment to going out and seeking a job or whatever, to hide behind their family or their family's vulnerability, to not live up to the requirements that anyone would expect from someone who is claiming um, uh, benefits? Uh, thank the member for his intervention. Uh, I would not want uh, vulnerable children to suffer because of an irresponsible um, parent or guardian. Um, I think there is the potential for that individual to suffer by removing benefits that may have been going to him until he would meet his requirements uh, under the agreement to receive, receive benefits. So there still is the potential uh, under what we are proposing that that individual would suffer, but that he, his family, his, his, his partner and his children would not suffer. And I think that is a much more uh, fairer society were it to be created on that basis. I would also highlight that were ultimately uh, um, families to be made homeless through this, they will probably be uh, uh, landing down uh, and result in additional significant costs uh, to the public in terms of emergency housing because vulnerable children will need to be looked after. So by uh, not uh, in ensuring that there is adequate protection for the irresponsible parent, that there is protection uh, against him, that those in the rest of the household would be protected, he potentially uh, adds huge misery to those who should not face it, and also huge cost to the public purse from emergency housing. So it's because of the iniquitous implications of what's being proposed that the Ulster Unis Party decided that this would be one of the areas that we wanted to change. And let us all be very clear in this debate. When you change an aspect of welfare reform, there are financial implications, and there will be costs to uh, uh, the, the block grant. But I think it is responsible that we discuss these issues, that we weigh up what the cost is and what the benefit is. And I would certainly argue that there are areas where costs may not be excessive and, what, and which the benefits to members of our society may be considerable and therefore we should be open to amendments. But I certainly uh, uh, am aware that the department had previously indicated that where one claimant refused to sign a commitment uh, and then left the household that the person uh, will have been excluded from the claim and the household will have to submit a new claim. But there are other issues around that. Will the, will the benefit then start from the date of issue of the new claim? Will that leave a period where no funding, no housing benefit will be paid into that household. Uh, uh, so there are uh, areas, uh, grey areas around there that I certainly believe there needs to clarification on. <coughs> uh, I also fails uh, uh, to address the fundamental problem of what happens if that stubborn party uh, doesn't leave the household and remains within the household. There are uh, complications that I want uh, to hear uh, certainty that vulnerable members of our community will not face difficulties. 
That failed, however, uh, uh, sorry, the Social Security offices and independent advice centres up and down the country will agree that, whilst it may sound improbable, it does actually happen. Certainly. Is he not actually arguing against the point that he made earlier? Because he, had, he indicated that, well, if there was one of the partners was not prepared to give a commitment, the answer is to take the benefit off them and punish them rather than the rest of the family. Now he's telling us that the potential is that the non-committing partner could stay in the house and so still benefit from the housing benefit the, and the, the, the fact that benefits will be paid to keep a roof over their head. So there's no punishment um, according to his own logic. I, I am, there will be punishment because there will be a lack of funds to the household. The, the, the individual uh, will face a degree of pressure. What I think the member needs to reflect on, does he want that partner and vulnerable children out on the street? Is that the punishment that he wishes for? There needs to be balance and careful thought in all that we do. But whilst the numbers affected in this type of scenario may be, may be relatively small, I, I believe that there, there is potentially a huge impact on vulnerable individuals and therefore uh, there is merit in what is being proposed in our amendment. I, I certainly believe it's a very sensible alternative. Whereas we, uh, in it, we are instructing the department to allow certain cases to be carefully considered. In other words, assessors will have the flexibility to allow claims to go ahead if, as is for the benefit of the remaining members of the household, rather than being rejected outright by another automated system, by a computer that, you know, people don't have an ability to be flexible, that they're ticking boxes and this is what the system tells will happen and children potentially being put on the street. The person refusing to sign their commitment will of course still uh, not be entitled uh, uh, to support as I've said, but importantly it means that their selfish pig-headed approach will no longer prevent the rest of the household from receiving support. I, I believe that this line of thought also complements what's already in the bill in the first paragraph of Schedule 1, but it makes it more explicit and clear uh, and that uh, removes any uncertainty that may be. I'm aware that the Department has accepted my party's request uh, of this in the, the Stormont House talks, so the amendment is simply reflecting that. And I will listen carefully to what the Minister uh, 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 and others say. Can he assure me in this House publicly that uh, he will honour what our amendment proposes uh, through guidance? We will then, if he is able to do that, we'll have to reflect uh, uh, further. But I think uh, it is important that this issue is addressed, it's important that it's aired, and it's for that reason uh, that I have moved the amendment. I would remind him that the, uh, and the department that my party has shown good face faith by slightly uh, revising the, the amendment from what was originally tabled to try and ensure something which is practical and deliverable uh, would uh, exist. And I hope that, uh, uh, that he and his colleagues will not be knocking this out uh, with all their petitions of concern or allowing anyone else to knock it out. I hope that everyone in this House sh should be able to support this reasonable amendment. Turning on to amendment number eight, frequency of payments. Frequency of payments is another uh, major touchstone issue which dominated the earlier assembly discussion around welfare reform. And I welcome the SDLP's decision to, to sign our amendment. As the minister will be fully aware, his predecessor asked uh, a number of voluntary organizations uh, with uh, investigating the proposal of moving to monthly payments and, and they find that such a default system would have had the potential to cause major difficulties for claimants, especially in terms of uh, being uh, able to uh, appropriately budget for their outgoings. Already, I am, I am aware uh, of individuals uh, coming to my office occasionally looking for uh, support, emergency support, perhaps having to refer individuals uh, to food banks. Now, now there is good things happening in the community and voluntary sector, but if we were to move to uh, monthly payments, flat out, no, no variation, I suspect there is a huge danger 
that the community and voluntary sector, uh, with the good work that they are doing in assisting vulnerable people, could be absolutely swamped, absolutely swamped, because many, uh, as of yet, do not have uh, the skills to, 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 to budget beyond a relatively short period. We have to uh, ensure that there is support uh, to try and uh, increase those skills. Uh, certainly, particularly welcome the engagement of Christians Against Poverty in, in my own area, who I know are working with uh, some of the food banks to try and uh, empower people uh, to, to try and live within, within their budgets uh, and avoid the necessity to seek emergency aid. Yes, I will. Just, uh, I'm interested in the engagement that he has with members of the community, and I, I'm just wondering, would he also tell them that his party's 2010 manifesto, which is identical to that of the Tories, is the unmitigated bill yeah, which yeah. Is, pre is presented to this House today, and it is the mitigations that are being presented to this House today which will actually deal with the issues that Mr Beggs is talking about? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, I, I believe the member uh, sister party uh, is also uh, has the origin in this bill, <laughs> so I, I find his comments, I find his comments uh, very, very strange. But let me make it let me make it very clear. Let, let, let me make it very clear. This, this is a devolved assembly. We are assembly members. We, we are accountable for our actions. And I would have hoped order, that we would not have the petitions of concern in order that this assembly can make its decisions in a responsible ma manner. Ministers, ministers, I, I wish to proceed. Ministers, both past and present, fortunately appear now to have accepted this proposal uh, as a default position uh, of, of twice monthly uh, payments, and I welcome that. But I wish to have, them, have clarity given uh, on this issue from the, the, the minister. Um, it's important that we avoid using a criterion based approach. Uh, which will undoubtedly uh, uh, save an administration costs uh, and, and the short and the long term. But as I have said, there are dangers in having tick boxes and potentially someone not saying what would be a common sense uh, approach. Importantly, however, I understand that some households may prefer monthly payments, and that is why uh, uh, my party uh, uh, would want to allow this for an option that those that choose, and again, that would uh, minimise uh, administration costs, the opt-out of four, or twice monthly to single payment, if that is what, what individuals wish. My party has in recent days now received some assurances on this that, and we were, well, that we were pre previously seeking. In part, we welcome uh, offering of choice as to how regular these uh, these, those claimants would be, wish to receive their payments that they would be able to decide. I would simply ask the Minister, uh, in place of us putting this question, to reaffirm his commitment to a default position of twice monthly payments. Not only this, I would expect him to show uh, the Social Development Committee uh, its due respect as soon as possible in terms of any uh, future uh, event of uh, proposed changes uh, in policy <coughs> and, and that their views could be taken on board. Turning now to uh, Amendment number 18, medical evidence for work-related activity. As members of this House uh, will be only too well aware, at present there are major problems uh, with the system of assessing those who have limited capability for work and therefore their entitlement to employment and support allowance. In fact, I would go further as to say that the current system is not fit for purpose. I accept that uh, assessing claims on whether their current health condition or disability restricts their ability to work is an enormous task for the department and its agency. However, it is a system that unquestionably needs to be improved. The transition from incapacity to ESA was chaotic and simply did not work with many problems arising. I have heard that the department previously boast that 67% of all appeals heard on ESA decisions were upheld in its favour. But that misses the point. That means a third of its decisions were wrong. I, I, I came from the world of industry where you should be trying to get it right first time. And the concept of being happy with a third of decisions wrong is, is, is not something which 
most normal businesses would operate under and clearly needs to be improved. And of course, uh, when decisions are made incorrectly, there is those additional costs associated with, with appeal, uh, and that's something that also we have to pay for. We will all have experiences through our offices of what looks like a rather rational claim being re rejected. Of course, the problem is the person can present a very different image of themselves during a so-called medical assessment, rather than what we may know uh, as the, to be the reality and having spent some time in talking to them and, and observing them ourselves, perhaps more time than, than may be available in, in the assessment. There are few cases um, uh, as difficult to make an informed assessment of on that day as those presenting with mental health difficulties. And of course the Northern Ireland uh, epidemic of mental health problems connected with the legacy of our troubles. Uh, so, so there is an issue, there, a very real issue in our community which is presenting on this. It's any wonder that we have the uh, world's highest rate of post-traumatic stress disorder. Such, such facts, however, have not been reflected in the ESA assessments, and it's also the Unionist Party's real concern that it will continue uh, to not be reflected in the future limited capability assessments for universal credit. The absence of medical re records will inevitably lead to wrong decisions being made and too many uh, appeals going against the department. Why can medical evidence not be reviewed before the formal appeal? Clearly, if that, I believe if that medical evidence were available at an earlier stage, the need for the applicant to present uh, at the formal appeal process would be uh, abated. And of course, remember, an appeal is not to the benefit of either genuine claimants or the department. The delay in receiving benefits and the huge administrative costs involved with appeals can cause real problems for both parties. I don't doubt that on the day the department does its best to make uh, a fully informed decision which accurately reflect a customer's circumstances. But without crucial documents such as psych uh, psych psychology reports, it's now impossible to make accurate assessments. There is a real problem with fresh evidence in support of an appeal only becoming available on the day of appeal with the department previously stating that uh, in four out of five appeals which were upheld in favour of the customer, new supporting evidence is produced by the customer which was not available to inform the department's original decision. It makes far more sense to have this evidence, which is usually medical reports, available uh, at an earlier stage, uh, at an earlier assessment. Our amendment number 18 would ensure that any assessment of a person's capability for work or work-related activity would take into account a relevant medical evidence. Whilst the issue of medical evidence has been settled for uh, PIP, there has been no such understanding found for the transition across to universal credit. However, I do accept that financial implications attached to our amendment may be significant. And given the costs already uh, encountered with the rest of the mitigation measures in the Assembly, we need to reflect as to whether we should pass this additional cost to the Department. As the Minister has been made aware, this amendment was designed to have the debate on the issue. I'm sure that every other party has concerns with the current arrangements, so it's clearly something that needs to be addressed. I and my colleagues will listen carefully to the response of the Minister, and I hope he accepts that the problems attached to work capability assessments and as well hoping uh, that uh, he will lay out exactly uh, what we are likely to see uh, in the future with universal credit proposals. <coughs> Medical evidence uh, for, for PIP then. Our amendment should be fairly uh, self-explanatory, yet it is hugely important. I trust that it will be accepted, as not only does it make perfect sense to have the right medical reports, but it is also an idea which I know each of the main parties uh, would appear to have already suggested that they and, and would support. Uh, so I welcome that. The transition from DLA to PIP is going to be an enormous task. So I welcome the decision 
to set up, set up a fund that will hopefully al uh, allow for the required medical reports without imposing huge additional costs on those who, who have vulnerabilities and may well have difficulty in, in paying for it themselves personally. I would have concerns on the wider issue of having to pay several million pounds to GP, GPs for what many people may believe they should be already doing. And, and when you think of the average GP on £94,000 a year, you thought that this would not be a, an unreasonable task to take uh, uh, part of this uh, responsibility on board. I fully appreciate the measures facing uh, our GPs at present. They are under pressure. However, I do ask the Minister to provide an update on the preliminary discussions between his department and the Department of Health, uh, Social Services and Public Safety in regard to a GP contract being shaped in future years to include medical reports. That, of course, will apply equally to work capability assessments as well as uh, personal independent payments. Now moving on to a few other amendments before us today, uh, looking at amendment number three uh, on joint claims from the SDLP. Uh, I would have thought uh, that it is unnecessary uh, given uh, what, what we are ourselves are proposing. There is a subtle but important difference between their amendment and ours. The also Unis Party amendment proposes allowing the Department to show some flexibility to assess those types of cases on an individual basis where the SDLPs remain much wider as it was agreed uh, sorry, uh, much wider. It was agreed by all parties, including the SDLP, that flexibility through guidance was the prepared way forward. And I would ask members uh, from all parties, irrespective of the petition of concern, uh, to give support for the general intent of what our amendment uh, number one in the name of Robin Swan and myself is proposing. Yes I will. Uh, the the, I don't know. Uh, the, the member is uh, going through a series of amendments, not just of his own party, but of the SDLPs. Has he given any thought to, or will he elaborate at some point in his speech, on the cost of the amendments if they were to be carried? I, I will be uh, listening very carefully to the minister as we go forward. We, we, have, we, have, we have some areas uh, carefully calculated. Uh, as best we can, but ultimately it is the Minister and the Department who will have much more accurate information. Uh, and that's why we have built in a degree of flexibility into our amendment, in order that the Minister uh, will be able to use the information that he and others do not have uh, to, to uh, uh, make adjustments, but yet try to address this real need, and, and also without loading in potentially unnecessary bureaucratic costs. It is right that we consider how we can improve, and as I have said some time ago, it's also important that we have an understanding of any costs that may uh, flow from amendments. Uh, and some, some of us will decide that some amendments are worth paying that money. Others may take uh, a different approach, and that is their right. Certainly, it should be the decision, ultimately, of a vote in this assembly to determine what they go on. I wish now to move on to amendment number four in relation to the documents uh, through third parties. And again, we will listen uh, with interest to how the minister responds to the proposal. Our opinion is certainly that charities, social workers and housing associations would be trust, uh, in a trustworthy position to uh, provide required documentation. I am, however, aware that the department has already confirmed that the guidance will cover the acceptance of documentation from third parties, something which I believe it is already, uh, is already accepted practice. Um, and again, I look forward to see what the Minister will, will say on this issue. In regard to Amendment number 9, it makes sense on a practical level, so much so that I would be surprised if the Department did not already propose having due regard for them. Uh, turning now to uh, Mr. News Amendments 10, 37 and 57. They are no doubt well intentioned, but unfortunately I believe they, are also, they also undermine themselves. There has long been concern about the work focused health related assessments and those coming down the line for the personal uh, independence payment PIP. 
as our own amendment number 18 and 35, where we are opening up the debate on medical evidence. However, I wonder, do we really want to go down the road of having to direct so many of our already overstretched GPs or experienced nurses of having to carry the, out these tests? I'm not opposed to healthcare professionals approved by the department carrying out these assessments, as long as they take into account available medical records and they are suitably qualified to make medical judgments themselves. Making sure that we have the right competence of assessors should be an absolute priority right now, not necessarily who their employer is. Nevertheless, I will listen to what the, uh, the member has to say on this issue, uh, not least in regard to how he believes his amendments would be delivered with the, within the already uh, existing pressures facing our GPs and trust staff. Certainly. I, I thank the member for giving way. Um, in, in the past, such as assessments were carried out by in-house in medical professionals. Um, one way or another, we have to pay for these professionals. One way or another, we have to train these professionals through our universities. Um, it is simply a question of oversight and accountability. The record of ATOS in England, um, to me, would suggest that that oversight and accountability wasn't uh, sufficient. <clears throat> I agree that they, they do have to be paid, but why do they have to be employed by the trust? They could be employed by the department. They could be employed by an agent of the department. The member has been very uh, prescriptive in what he is proposing. At, at face value, the Ulster Unionist Party agrees with amendments number 12 and 13. As we all know, people are subject to domestic violence who rightly have been given additional protection in the bill. And now we've been asked to expand that to incidents motivated by hate. Of course, Northern Ireland is only too well versed, sadly, in such incidents, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, religion, sectarianism, race. So yes, we would be uh, open for them being included in the bill. However, and it is a big however, as the members who will later propose the amendment will likely already be aware, there is currently no formal definition of hate incidents. While some will be easily understood, and for very many others, it may, well, it may not be just as clear. I suspect, suspect that is why the members have passed the responsibility of categorising such incidents to the department under 9b of their amendment. Our concern is that without the definition, we are potentially opening up a can of worms, which the department will face constant challenge on, perhaps, uh, again, legal costs, uh, delays. And I trust the, 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 the minister has sought advice of certainly qualified legal minds uh, in this regard. So I look forward to hearing what he has to say on this issue. In regard to amendment number 17, I would uh, first ask for clarification from Mr. Ramsey, well, perhaps later on, who I thought had been previously assured by the Health Minister that the Independent Living Fund in Northern Ireland was going to be retained in some form after June 2015. If that is the case, then it is, uh, is something that I would welcome, as it would allow some 600 disabled people here currently receiving support from it to continue to lead their own independent lives in the community. However, given the almost inevitable end of the scheme across the water later this year, I understand ours, even if it was retained, would probably undergo some reform. If we decide that we should, it should be for the Social Development Minister, uh, supported by Dell and the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, uh, it is better to give them the 18-month time frame as stated in the amendment. If, however, this amendment has been tabled without the knowledge of either the Department of Health, the Department of Social Development and, and, and the LSA, then I do have a question uh, uh, whether it really was the most appropriate time to make the proposal. Not least as I suspect its more natural home would be within the Department of Health. But again, I will listen to the contribution of others on this issue. Amendments number 19 and 36 from the SDLP are fairly similar to those that we tabled previously and which also appeared on today's list. Even the most objective observer would struggle to see what really is the difference 
uh, between them. I would fully expect mental health, mental ill health to be already to be covered by the reference to medical evidence that we make. They both propose doing this exactly the same thing. The important thing is to make sure that the issue is addressed. Turning now to amendments number 38 and 39, again from Mr. Agnew, uh, who uh, moved the bait into something new. He is proposing changing the prospective test, the length in which the personal independent payment claims are likely to continue in the future to meet the disability condition, conditions from nine months to six. We must be conscious that it would be a fairly uh, fundamental breach of party if we were to, were to accept this. And there's a degree of uncertainty what the cost would be. But again, I, I would say this would be, this would be raising uh, an issue of unfairness across uh, the UK. In some cases, no doubt, uh, uh, very, uh, very difficult to predict if a, complainant's, a claimant's condition is likely to improve within nine months. So maybe six months would lead to more accurate assessments. But I do have to ask, what will be the additional costs and administration? Because uh, this assembly is likely to bear those additional costs. Uh, and again, I look forward to what the minister may have to say on the issue so that we may all come to a judgment on it. Again, I go back to what I said at, very early in my debate. We have a responsibility to assess the need, the benefit that will come from change, but also what the cost will be, and is that cost proportionate to the issue. Regardless of the amendment, I welcome the fact that terminally ill claimants will be exempt from this test. Turning now to Amendment 43, which proposes ensuring the Department will issue entitlements in cash in cases where the claimant has no access to a bank account. I have concerns about this, as I believe that in such cases the priority of the Department and the advice agencies should continue to be encouraging the claimant to open up an account, where a post office card account uh, or, or indeed a bank account. Without one, how are they realistically expected to, uh, to budget and manage their outgoings from one month to the other? There are other be also benefits in not having people uh, being over-reliant and charge carrying all their earthly belongings potentially in their back pocket. It is much safer if people have, have an account and are able to draw off as, as, as they need. A bank account, a building society or credit union accounts do provide some level of security. I am also aware that at present when a claimant does not have any of these accounts, arrangements are made for them to be paid using a post office uh, card account. Uh, and even if that is not possible, payments can be issued through the simple payment service. So there are mechanisms of dealing for the very difficult situations where immediate payment perhaps may be necessary. But uh, uh, I will be listening to Mr. Agnew to hear his rationale for the amendment number 43. But certainly at this stage, the Ulster Unionist Party would be inclined to oppose for some of the reasons I've just mentioned. We will be opposing uh, amendments number uh, uh, 44, which proposes to allow for the payments in cases where, uh, uh, there, which are pending appeal. That amendment were it to go through would be setting quite a dangerous precedent and one which would also entail inevitable cost to the executive. Um, I haven't heard any explanation as to why this additional cost sh should be borne. Uh, uh, there will be other uh, benefits that many will be entitled to and uh, certainly uh, our intention would be, would be to oppose. We will also, certainly. He has on a couple of occasions referred to, to cost and rightly so, of course, we have to take it into consideration. Um, there is obviously in the budget a top-up payment. My, my argument would be that uh, we decide as an assembly where those top-up payments should be in the legislation rather than relying on what comes from the executive um, to decide how that money is spent. So my proposal is we have a top-up payment budgeted for, and I'm certainly putting forward amendments, some of which cost money, um, but should, that top-up payment should be used to cover. I, I, I look forward to hearing the member's contribution, and I hope he will also explain where money coming to fund all his amendments will come from, what other public services will be cut in order to fin finance them. There are real choices. 
There are real choices which could impact on health of some of the same individual the member may be trying, trying to assist. There are choices, there are difficult decisions. That is what uh, 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 politics and government uh, should be about. I look forward to hearing the member's contribution and the minister outline what costs may, may, may be. We will, we will propose, I wish to proceed, we will be proposing amendment number, uh, uh, we're opposing amendment number 45. I understand that the proposer uh, is coming at it from an angle of a claimant who has been in the receiving end of a department error. Of course, while fraud is deliberate, error is not. Unfortunately, it will probably be inevitable that given the scale of our welfare system, sometimes mistakes are made. Maybe still too often on occasions. Yes, yes, that is the case. But that's the reality. It is useful to remember that there's quite a difference between customer fraud, customer error, and official error. Customer fraud makes up to 0.5%. Uh, customer error makes up 0.2%. And staff error makes up 0.4%. Mr. Agnew's amendment, I assume, is seeking to address the 0.4% of staff error and maybe some of the 0.2 of customer error. Given our welfare system costs almost as much as our health service, even though that is a very uh, small percentage term, it may well end up uh, as a very significant number, perhaps north of, of 15 million pounds. Again, where is the money coming for to pay it? Uh, and is Mr. Agnew seriously suggesting that we simply forget about uh, the amount of money each and every year. Uh, if, if we do not ourselves withdraw it from our, our block grant, we can be sure that fines or costs will be imposed. And again, I say, what will be the cost to other public services, health and education? I would say, uh, in uh, drawing back overpayment, it is important that the department are very sensitive about it. They take into consideration uh, individual household circumstances and do it over uh, a, a lengthy extended period so that undue uh, uh, hardship is not caused by that departmental error. But nevertheless, potentially significant amounts may have been given to a household who would not have been entitled to it. But again, I would ask that the, the Minister address this issue. But regardless of whose faults it may be, this is public money, and at the end of the day, I would expect, expect nothing but the utmost caution and due regard shown by the department. Uh, but if a mistake has been made, it should be rectified, or other public services uh, will, will, will suffer. I do believe that there is uh, uh, generally a strong emphasis on accuracy. However, in cases in which there is not, and people receive more than they are entitled to, they should reasonably expect to pay it back. As someone who's working, who receives an overpayment, you can be sure that their employer uh, subsequent weeks will point out the mistake and draw it back. Equally so, someone in receipt of benefits, if they receive an overpayment, uh, uh, discussion should occur and it should be paid back. Uh, again, I would urge that the department should not immediately uh, go to legal action, the persons, but, the, but there is a range of options open not least in drawing back any overpayments through a deduction uh, in uh, future benefits. Moving on, I note that the Minister's opposition to Clause 129. I believe the National Insurance Contributions Act of last year has already restored what was being proposed, so we too believe the clause is unnecessary. Amendment number 53 uh, for the SDLP is, is a sensible one and which the Ulster Unionist Party will be happy to support. It has always been one of our concerns, and not least from the end of 2012, when the then Minister shamefully tried to steamroller the GB bill through the Assembly. Thankfully, his, his attempts at scaremongering were ignored, and we now have the potential of a much improved bill, and one which, uh, to the greater extent, acknowledges and mitigates against some of the worst aspects for the victims and survivors of the Troubles. We would uh, just add some caution, however, to this amendment. If, as we hope, it is made, we would request that the Department work as quickly and, po and helpfully uh, uh, with the Northern Ireland Commission for Victims uh, as quickly and helpfully as possible. 
Many of the regulations will be technical and often difficult to assess at first hand. And uh, assessing every regulation as is suggested in the amendment will put major strain on the Commission for Victims. We trust that the Department will act constructively with the body and its staff, especially now as it continues to operate without a Commissioner. I, just, I, I do thank the Member for giving way, and I'm sorry if I've interrupted his train of thought, but just in relation to. Well, he's doing very well and uh, making very valid points, and I, I, I would hope that members could listen to them. But in relation to Amendment 53, uh, that is, I, I believe, a very important amendment, uh, and one that puts victims at the very centre of uh, the welfare system, victims of the troubles, uh, people who have suffered uh, grievously, either physical or mental uh, problems as a result of the troubles. Uh, does the member agree uh, with the general thrust of that amendment? And would the member agree with me that it would be a terrible shame, a terrible shame for this House to reject that particular amendment, uh, and in particular that it would be rejected by a petition of concern that would do a grave disservice to all of those who have suffered as a result of the troubles? I, I, I agree with what the member ha has said. I, I'm also very minded uh, uh, in terms of dealing with individuals in my constituency office that frequently uh, when those who have been traumatized uh, in the troubles, who have been victims, um, that what they, they, they feel they almost have to live, relive some of their incidents to retell uh, uh, the horrors that they experienced. Uh, to expose the, 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 the damage that has been done physically and men mentally to them in order that they can receive the benefits that they are entitled to. That can set back individuals again each time they relive that. And it is for that reason that we have been suggesting that there needs to be this early engagement with the uh, Northern Ireland Commission for Victims as soon as possible in order that where there is very clear documented uh, evidence that, that can be, uh, the whole approach can be looked to try and uh, mitigate and minimise the impact on, on victims of the troubles uh, in, in this assessment processes which they may be required in order to gain their benefits. Finally, the last amendment in the group, amendment number 74 from Mr New again proposes removing the power from the department to issue payment in the form of vouchers. I have to say vouchers may play a role. They could assist someone who has an addiction. At this stage, we have not heard any compelling argument, either politically or from, uh, in, in public, which makes us believe that this section deserves to be taken out. Surely that option should remain. Uh, we certainly, uh, if it is uh, enacted and used in regulations, it is an area that needs to be carefully monitored and reviewed. But at this st stage, uh, we would be minded to uh, oppose the amendment from the, mem the member because we recognise that potentially uh, this may have merits. And again, I go back to a vulnerable situation where um, uh, children may be involved in households where uh, uh, someone has an addiction. And a, a voucher system could actually be beneficial to that family, ensuring that vulnerable individuals are not put excessively at risk. It is very complicated for social services to look at every case, to, to be there all the time, to try and look out for those in need. But I certainly believe that vouchers ought to be considered as a tool, uh, may be reviewed as, as, as time goes along with experience, but I certainly think it would be wrong to rule it out at this stage. I, I thank the member for giving way. And I, I understand this is uh his argument, and I, I've worked with people with addiction, so I, I, I know the problems. Um, but the problem is that when we license supermarkets to sell alcohol, um, so you give people food vouchers, um, but they, 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 they can still use them in premises that sell alcohol. The member has highlighted a problem. Now, that's the problem which, in turn, passes to, to the minister and the department to get round. But it's not a reason why uh, they should be excluded. There are many. Uh, 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 supermarkets, many markets who do not serve alcohol if, if you are talking about alcohol uh, as a particular addiction. So there are ways of means 
Uh, and I think, again, I say it's wrong to exclude this as an option at this stage. I would much prefer that this uh, be held as a tool within the departmental arsenal to be considered. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it does need to be scrutinised and its outworkings followed. But I would much prefer that that option would remain uh, to be considered by the department and officials as a useful tool in, in dealing with some of uh, uh, some of our uh, most vulnerable members of our community in order that some of the rest of their household, maybe even they themselves, uh, it may even actually help them. Um, I've certainly uh, come across uh, uh, some constituents who ha have alcoholism and uh, I would say not making the best use of the, the support that is available to them, uh, uh, perhaps contributing to their addictions. So I think this should be left as an option uh, uh, for the department to determine and for ourselves to scrutinise it further down the line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Social Development, Mr. Alec Maskey. Um, the Assembly will be aware that the Committee for Social Development produced a report on the Welfare Reform Bill two years ago, February 2013. Um, the Committee held 22 meetings to consider the bill. We received written submissions from 55 organisations and individuals, and we took oral evidence from 31 of those organisations. The committee therefore gave the bill extensive consideration and made a number of recommendations on foot of the evidence it received. In doing so, it also opposed a number of clauses, one of which, opposition to clause 99, is in this uh, group. And I will come to that in just a moment, uh, Kion Korla. It is fair to say that during the committee stage, the committee was unanimous in its views regarding the potential impact of the bill. I think it's important to restate that, that obviously these concerns about the impact were shared across the political uh, spectrum. So there was deep concern across the parties in the uh, DSD committee at the time, and that concern was shared by a wide range of stakeholders who gave evidence to the committee that this radical reform of the welfare system, if left unchecked, could seriously impact on the most vulnerable groups in society, children, the sick, lone parents, persons with a disability, and so on. And the committee also was very uh, sympathetic to the arguments made around uh, access for, by claimants to independent advice. Um, indeed, members may recall that the committee was sufficiently concerned that it also agreed a motion standing order under Standing Order 35 to refer the bill to an ad hoc committee on conformity with human rights and equality requirements. However, the committee was also acutely aware of the potential cost implications of making changes to the bill, although it must be said that members of the committee were never truly convinced that they had received definitive uh, figures from the department. So it is important to note, Kian Kiora, that the committee adopted a flexible position, if you like, on the best approach to address the financial cost of possible mitigation measures. And the committee recognised the fact that the Department for Social Development could not fund these measures from its own budget. The committee therefore agreed that any recommendations that had costs associated with them would have to be discussed and agreed by the executive and by all of the parties at the executive. Therefore, uh, where the committee made recommendations that had associated costs, Committee members agreed to oppose those related clauses without prejudice to the outcome of the Minister's discussions and individual positions that may be taken by members at a later stage of the bill process. The committee felt that this allowed the Minister the flexibility uh, to engage with the executive colleagues on the potential to fund its recommendations and therefore offered the best possibility for adoption of a range of mitigation measures to address the Committee's concerns and those of stakeholders. I do not think any of us would have guessed that those discussions would only be finalised two years after the committee report published its actual report, but I believe that the outcome of the Stormont House negotiations have superseded in many ways uh, the concerns highlighted by the committee in its report. Indeed, the committee met yesterday and was briefed by the Department on the Minister's amendments. The committee noted these. The committee agreed uh, yesterday that, given the time that has elapsed since the publication of its report, and more importantly, the fact that we have the Stormont House Agreement, which was a five-party agreement, uh, which has addressed uh, many of the concerns relating to welfare reform. The committee is content that it is for individual members of the committee, therefore, to consider their position in relation to the committee's opposition to clauses referred to in the Marshall List of Amendments. And I would highlight to the House that the committee opposed ten clauses in total. And in this group, the amendments, the committee opposed uh, clause 99, which deals with payments to joint claimants. There will be obviously just more detailed discussions on all these matters in the course of today's uh, debate. But the committee's concern at the time related to flexibility, the flexibility that could be applied to payments. 
in terms of the regularity of payments and to split payments. The committee favoured an approach where the payment would be made twice per month and an option for a payment to be split between claimants in a household rather than a single payment per household. In this latter instance, the committee shared the concerns of stakeholders that on having denominated a member of the household to receive the payment, this could have a negative impact on the financial independence of women in particular, and therefore a potentially negative impact on children, given that in our society it is still largely the case that women tend to be the main carer and or the second earner in the family. However, uh, there has been uh, undoubtedly significant progress on this and other matters relating to the Committee's opposition to clauses, which I will come to as the debate develops over the course of the day. Therefore, as I noted, I will leave the Committee members to decide for themselves regarding the current position vis-à-vis -vis that of the Committee uh, taken two years ago. And, and in other words, and very simply, uh, given the fact that the Committee did express opposition to a number of the clauses of the Bill. The Committee took the view that, in light of the Stormont House Agreement, the most, if not all, of those concerns have been addressed in one way or another. And whenever about the precise arguments around the legislation, either by way, by way of legislation and amendments tabled by the Minister and or the mitigation measures, most of the concerns of members have been met. And, uh, I think the Committee on that basis then has mandated myself simply to record to the House today as the Chair of the Committee that the Committee will not be formally recording opposition to any of the clauses uh, during today's debate. And, and Mr Speaker, uh, could I first of all uh, again place on, on my record thanks to the Committee at that time for the very extensive deliberation it gave to the Bill. Uh, the, exhausted amount of work that was carried out to make sure that all aspects of the bill were considered and appropriate recommendations made uh, to the Minister uh, on, on the basis of those discussions. and particularly thank all of the stakeholders who came and gave their evidence and just to remind people that included people from the church and the faith-based organi churches organisations, the uh, community and the voluntary sector, the advice sector, uh, ethnic minority organisations, the human rights equality commissions, uh, a whole range of organisations, trade unions as well, a whole range of organisations who came and made very considered uh, submissions, both written and orally, to the committee. And as I've said, uh, uh, I feel like I think it's important to record that all of the members uh, in unanimous uh, fashion uh, agreed a report which I have just uh, addressed there in the last few minutes. Um, so therefore, I just want to thank all those people who did participate and, in my view, helped to shape the debate from that time, which, even though it has, uh, two years has elapsed, <coughs> nevertheless, I think all of us will be very pleased to acknowledge that there has been considerable progress made against all of the concerns that were expressed by the stakeholders and indeed the committee in this instance. And there is no doubt that much work yet needs to be done. The committee and others will remain vigilant as to the uh, effects of welfare as it progresses through the Assembly in the time ahead after this bill is, is dealt with and disposed. And Mr Speaker, <coughs> with your indulgence, I would also like to make a few remarks as an individual MM, MLA on behalf of my party. Okay, or I get that, and I will uh, be brief. I just want to make a couple of points in, in relation to the remarks made by Mr. Roy Beggs of the Ulster Unionist Party, because he's been the first to speak on this uh, particular group. I actually find it beggars belief to listen to the remarks of the member uh, in this house this morning. Uh, this is the member representing a party which was joined at the hip with the Tory government in London under UCOMF, which promoted this particular policy, this pledge which actually has had the effect of imposing uh, swinging cuts not only in terms of welfare but also on public services which people right across our community have had to uh, endure and which I am delighted to be able to say that other parties standing against also unionist commitments at that time have actually addressed a lot of those concerns. And I just want to place on the record, uh, Mr Speaker, because I think it is important uh, that the public are aware of all of this. During the course of the committee deliberations on this matter, I actually conducted a number of bilaterals with all of the parties in this House, uh, including the also Unionist Party. The also Unionist Party during those bilaterals never made one single commitment to address any of those issues. I personally had to go to Mr Mike Nesbitt and ask him to give support to his party colleague Michael Copeland, the member on the Social Development Committee, who told us in the committee that he was not allowed by the party to make any commitment in relation to the Welfare Reform Bill. And I stand and accuse the Ulster Unionist leader today and their party today of a an, absolute, an absolute 
abject failure of integrity in this matter because the party which stood on a pledge to slash public funding and to slash uh, welfare benefits to people out there who are most vulnerable was not prepared to make one single commitment to address it. And in fact, only in the last number of weeks, the leader of that Ulster Unit Party was telling everybody we couldn't get any more money, there's nothing more we could do, we had a good deal as it was. Well, unfortunately for the Ulster Unionist Party today, who in grandstanding. <coughs> The member is factually incorrect in what he is saying. So I'd ask the Speaker to judge whether or not it is appropriate to say that the Ulster Unionist Party did nothing when almost two years ago amendments to this bill were placed. Yeah. I think that it's a question of the debate and the cut and thrust of debate. And the member may well, in those uh, remarks of his, simply be reflecting frustration at the lack of progress at particular times. That is his entitlement, as you yourself, I think, were quite forthright in some of your commentary. So, I mean, cut and thrust, this is meant to be a debate. I do think that we should try to avoid the practice of naming members across the, uh, the floor, because it's not conducive to uh, good temper and, and uh, you know, moderate kind of discussion. Uh, Maggot, uh, John Corda, I would actually uh, I mean, I want to concur with your remarks. I had wanted to come here this morning to actually be able to be in a position to welcome the fact that we have an agreement reached by all of the parties in the days before Christmas, which represents a far better deal for the people that we collectively as parties represent, that that deal allows an awful lot more money to be retained by those people that we represent that would not otherwise have been available due to the hard work that was carried out. I had much preferred to be coming into this chamber this morning given a very clear and positive and constructive message to the wider public that we collectively represent, saying that we have managed to broker a deal which is far and above anything which is anywhere else in these islands, and I am glad that we have been a very important uh, part of that. So that is what uh, the position I would have wanted to come here and address this morning, Ken Kiorla, but unfortunately, because others want the grandstand, and rather than look after the most vulnerable, they want to promote themselves, and that is why I have departed from what I have wanted to do. So, as I say, all the members will have all of the opportunity to address all of the issues today and this. I wanted to place on record the behaviour and the attitude and the role which was played by the Ulster Unionist Party, which is leading this group to be at this afternoon this morning. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I also welcome the opportunity uh, to speak on Group 1 of the amendments at this consideration stage. Can I, first of all, join with the Chair in thanking the committee staff, departmental officials and all of those who gave written responses and oral evidence? Mr Speaker, through the many hours of the committee scrutiny of the Welfare Reform Bill, there was, as the Chair said, a general consensus across all parties that this bill required certain changes in order to meet the needs of our constituents here in Northern Ireland. I can also recall the many event events and panel debates that I attended, usually alongside those sitting opposite me, although I'd like to forget some of those debates, uh, but where there were many of them. And, uh, we heard at those debates genuine concern, not only from voluntary and community groups, but also from uh, individuals and the public that live across Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, in this group we address the duties of the Department, Administration and Assessments. Having studied the fairly lengthy list of amendments, I am drawn to the conclusion that many are either not required or that they will be dealt with in the regulations. Indeed, Mr Speaker, if some of the members of the proposed amendments had been members of the DSD committee when we were undergoing the scrutiny, then they would have known that much of the detail will be dealt with in regulations rather than amendments to the bill. I do not intend to speak on all the amendments, we are very glad to hear, and I will keep uh, the rest of my speech brief, but I just want to address two of the amendments. If I first turn your attention to Amendment 4, tabled by the members of the SDLP, which sets out a new clause where a claimant is unable to provide documentation required to progress a claim. This was a concern raised within committee during initial scrutiny, especially for the vulnerable and those claimants who were homeless or living in temporary accommodation. As most of us would know who deal with benefit claimants through our constituency offices, at present third-party verification is accepted practice under the current claims and payment regulations. And as we also know, these are being transferred over to universal credit claims and payment regulations. This in turn will allow for third 
party verification to continue as it is at present. Mr. Speaker, this is just one example within the list of amendments in Group 1, which is not required. Mr. Speaker, I would like to turn to Amendment 8, which is again a new clause, this time put forward by the Ulster Unionist Party, which is in relation to the frequency of payments of universal credit. Again, this was an issue in which there was great concern from the committee and responses, both written and oral. There was grave concern under the proposed monthly payment that claimants would face financial hardship and this would ultimately be borne by the children in those families. It was also well documented within the written submissions that claimants should be free to choose rather than an enforced frequency of payment. One notable comment within the written submissions was from Advice NI on, on the issue, where they said that the frequency of payment, whether it's weekly, fortnightly or monthly, is geared towards meeting the needs of the person and not the system. As most of us should be aware, uh, though I do find it rather strange that the Ulster Unionist Party are not aware that of this, the frequency of payment was one of the packages of the measures the previous minister, Nelson McCausland, had agreed with the Department of Work and Pensions some time ago. And this minister has gone even one step further in October of last year in proposing that the default, default position be twice monthly. This is just another uh, amendment, this is just one of the many amendments in this that I feel should be dealt with in regulations rather than with uh, actual amendments to the bill. As we know, regulations will allow for greater flexibility and therefore much of which is listed in these amendments, the right place for that is within the regulations. Mr Speaker, these are just two examples. Would the member explain why would you need uh, flexibility uh, to pay uh, rather than actually put it into the bill that the default position is twice monthly. Why, why would you want flexibility on that issue that possibly could be amended at some point in the future? Why would you not wish it to be in the, in the actual face of the bill and everyone knows that that is nailed and that the individual would have an option to go for the monthly basis if that uh, is what they wish? Would the member explain? I thank the member for his intervention and uh, I want to explain to them that flexibility allows us to make changes as we all know, as you've stated as well. And for some, two weekly payments may not be what is required and we may want to make changes to that. We can't make those changes because of under, this is under, if we put it under primary legislation and therefore it's better that we have those uh, dealt with within the regulations in case we do need to meet those changes. Mr Speaker, can I just con conclude in saying I look forward to hearing the rationale from all the proposers of the tabled amendments, why they believe that these are required and of course how they propose to pay for some of the changes. Mr Speaker, I'm happy to support Amendment 35 and opposition to Clause 129, but will not be supporting any other amendments within Group 1. Thank you. And I call Ms Dolores Kelly. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm uh, pleased to speak on behalf of the SDLP in relation to the group of uh, amendments which our party has tabled uh, to this bill. Um, members are quite rightly outraged today at the petition of concern against all of the uh, amended uh, clauses, uh, given that it is uh, our belief uh, that it is an attack on democracy, an attack on this House to have its opportunity to scrutinise fully the implications of the bill. It is certainly not uh, the, the reason uh, that petitions of concern were intended. We all know, uh, Mr Speaker, that petitions of concern uh, were to be only used and deployed if it was felt uh, that one community over another would suffer an adverse impact. And we all know that the sufferers of uh, welfare reform, as proposed by the Tories, will be the most poor and vulnerable in our society. I suppose in that regard, uh, one part of our community is going to be, uh, have an adverse, suffer an adverse impact um, more so uh, than those who are relatively well off, uh, but, but of course they will be right across the community. It appears to me, Mr Speaker, that there are now more Tories in the DUP ranks uh, than ever before, and certainly I know a number of them were previously car card-carrying members of the Tory party. 
So, um, Mr. Speaker, I, 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 do, I deplore uh, the use of petition of concern in relation to this matter. Uh, one might uh, make a reasonable uh, uh, assumption that the late notice of petition of concern against these clauses was to save uh, the blushes of, uh, of the party to my right, who claimed that they were stalling on welfare reform in order to get more money from the British Treasury. That money didn't come. It's going to come from the other public sectors. But I think it is ironic, uh, Mr Speaker, that on the day that we are discussing the Welfare Reform Bill, it is the day that the news media uh, is, uh, is full of uh, the uh, tax avoidance uh, uh, used uh, by the world's wealthiest companies and individuals within uh, GB society. And I think last night we saw the sorry spectacle of many of the, uh, the wealthiest people tripping into uh, one of the big Tory dinner dances. Uh, where uh, the Tories have looked after their interests but have failed to look after the interests of the most poor. It's only uh, about four or five weeks ago, Mr Speaker, that Oxfam, in uh, preparing for a, a summit uh, of the world leaders, um, made the case that uh, over 1% of the world's wealth is now held, uh, no, one over 50% of the world's wealth is now held by 1% of the world's uh, population. And I think many uh, commentators, including uh, more recently Pope Francis, has stated about how growing wealth inequality, or wealth inequality is bad uh, for economic development, bad for good governance, and is surely morally wrong. So it is on that uh, backdrop, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the SDL who has not been um, uh, shy about the ne necessity of welfare reform and improvements to how the system operates. But we have uh, put forward amendments in the various groups of this bill with the intent to actually improve the lot of those people who are requiring assistance and help uh, through the welfare system. And I don't think uh, there is any shame in that. I think it's our responsibility and it has always been our stated intention uh, in relation to uh, the welfare reform bill. I also note, uh, Mr Speaker, that in some of their introductory remarks and contributions, other members have referred to the Stormont House Agreement. The Stormont House Agreement contains no more than six lines within the agreement in relation to welfare reform, the uh, introduction of the legislation and the flexibilities. And at yesterday's uh, committee, when uh, the officials came before the committee to explain uh, the minister's um, uh, uh, amendments uh, the, that we learnt uh, that the uh, flexibilities, that the agreement around how uh, some of the mitigating measures were going to be introduced has not yet uh, been reached uh, by the executive. So we're operating in somewhat of a vacuum in relation to the bill. I think it would be much more useful and uh, probably would not have been uh, so um, sceptical had we had the two in tandem before the House today and we could speak with a greater in information before us. Uh, we are going to listen carefully in relation to the Minister's commitments in relation to some of the amendments uh, that we have tabled and see whether or not uh, he will commit to bring forward uh, regulations which will allay some of our concerns in relation to the clauses that we are tabling today. So, uh, Mr Speaker, if I might then uh, address my um, party's uh, clauses. Mr Begg quite rightly said that in relation to Amendment 1 in Clause 4 that the SDLP had a similar amendment uh, and we are happy uh, that uh, we would uh, support uh, that uh, clause which actually will help where there is a, a breakdown in a family relationship or a, a lack of cooperation that uh, one me family member will not suffer uh, uh, consequently. So we are happy to support that. If I might uh, then uh, move to Amendment 3 which is uh, after clause six, uh, which is a similar one as to the Roy Beggs. We just felt uh, that ours was uh, uh, just in a different place in the bill. It was more just a question of, of where it positioned rather than any of the policy intention around that. If we then uh, move um, to amendment four, 
and the new clause where uh, this would allow third parties to obtain documents necessary for a claim where claimants cannot obtain it themselves. And I think that's fairly uh, self-explanatory. Uh, it, it is uh, something I note uh, that there's also a petition of concern around. You would have to ask why, other than uh, regulations might deal with it, and we'll await to hear what the Minister has to say. In relation to uh, Amendment 4, uh, this uh, amendment uh, inserts a new clause on the provision of claimant documentation when making a claim for universal credit. It provides that where a person cannot provide all the required documentation to make a claim, then there is provision made for third party verification in lieu of required documentation, including identity documents, so that the claim can be made. And as Ms. Bradley said, uh, this was something which the committee had similar concerns about whenever the, uh, the, the committee some two years ago uh, scrutinised uh, the uh, bill. So, again, that's something we'll await to hear with the Minister how he's going to uh, deal with this particular issue. We do think I think it's important to table the amendments so that we can hear from the Minister and get commitments on the floor of this House in relation to how uh, we move forward. Amendment uh, number nine uh, was, uh, is in relation to in preparing claimant commitments that the Department must have due regard for the claimant's skills, experience, current responsibilities and physical and mental ill health. Uh, the, the person who prepares the uh, I think, Mr. Speaker, this is important because we all across our constituency offices have uh, concerns in relation to uh, the types of jobs that people are being expected to undertake, where they do not require, uh, where they, uh, the skills and experience do not match uh, the work uh, that uh, people are being asked to take up. Uh, I don't think, uh, Mr. Speaker, there are many people who would. Um, uh, not uh, express uh, their difficulty and require retraining. But we're seeing this, Mr Speaker, against a backdrop where there's, there have been savage cuts uh, to the Dell budget in employment and, and training. And of course, uh, given the number of redundancies that some people are experiencing, not least in, in North Antrim, where there are 800 people uh, set to lose their jobs, there will be an obvious need to uh, spend money on retraining. And we would have concerns that uh, the opportunities are not going to be there uh, for people and also, um, Mr. Uh, Speaker, we do have concerns about uh, zero hours uh, contracts, which are on the increase. I think they're totally immoral. We see an increase uh, of temporary, part-time, low-paid jobs, and I do think uh, many people, uh, the vast majority of people who find themselves unemployed, do want to get back out into the workplace. But for some who find themselves unemployed at uh, maybe in their 40s or 50s, it is difficult. And I do believe uh, that there should uh, be greater uh, opportunity and cognizance given uh, to their life experience to their job experience and the, 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 the system or the government or the departments should be in a position to help people to retrain uh, and prepare themselves for a different uh, workplace. Uh, we also uh, uh, just want to make uh, one other point uh, of a general nature, uh, Mr. Speaker. We do not yet have a robust childcare strategy in place. We heard over recent weeks about the soaring costs of childcare, and I think it's all right for people who have never experienced unemployment uh, to make assumptions about people being work shy. That's not uh, the case in the vast majority of cases. The majority of people want to get out to work, they think it's better for their self-esteem, better for their self-confidence, provides a better role model for their family. But we know that if the family income is reduced to such a level where, where there's increasing levels of poverty and more and more children in the north of Ireland living in poverty, and in, uh, then I, I can understand why people have to make the choice about whether they take up uh, a job or not. And, uh, uh, and how that then imp impacts on their family. So the Tories' agenda of making work pay has not been accompanied by much more uh, 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 robust measures in terms of tackling uh, some of uh, the loopholes that employers use in, ter in, ter in the provision of terms and conditions for such employment. And it is a matter of regret, uh, Mr. Speaker, that this executive has not yet got its head around uh, providing good, ch good affordable childcare to enable people to go back into the workplace. If I might then um, 
Mr. Speaker, turn my attention to Amendment 8. And, uh, amendment 8. This, this amendment induce, uh, introduces the default position of an award of universal credit being paid twice monthly unless on a claimant or joint claimants opt to be paid on a monthly basis. And I heard uh, what Mrs Bradley said, and again this is something which I'm sure the Minister will, will hopefully address, and we will uh, listen carefully to that and then make a judgment uh, later on in the day as the debate uh, continues, uh, Mr Speaker. We then at Amendment 9, and this is um, Amendment 9 looks at making provision for the department again as around claimant skills when completing a claimant commitment. And uh, we, we need to uh, assure, uh, be assured uh, that people have uh, the, the, the right help. Uh, at the right time, because we all know how complicated uh, many of these forms. I mean, we can hardly keep up across our constituency offices because of the change in nature. And I think it would be true to say that whilst uh, a lot of the welfare reform has to be agreed uh, by this House, it's also the case that some other welfare uh, reform comes from Westminster, and uh, the. the the, for example, some of the childcare and tax vouchers are uh, uh, non-default matters. So, therefore, there's already a very changed landscape out there, and it is very difficult uh, to keep up for, uh, for professionals, never mind a person who finds themselves being in a circumstance when they first have to enter uh, into that whole system and that world who have never potentially been unemployed uh, before. Uh, in Amendment uh, 11, uh, the, we ask the department to take account of the relevant medical evidence, including evidence of mental ill health. And I heard what others said in relation to how uh, that is currently the case. But I think, Mr. Speaker, given the track record of ATOS in particular, it is very clear to me in my own constituency work and, and representational role that uh, there's quite a bit of set aside and different interpretation by a number of those uh, healthcare professionals who. Um, uh, have before them uh, medical evidence but disregard it and if I can give you one particular example as to why uh, I would be very concerned. I represented a lady who has an arthritic condition called ankylosing spondylitis which is a degenerative chronic condition which meant uh, she wasn't able to continue in her job as home help as it used to be known and uh, the healthcare professional was a qualified nurse who made the assessment and she turned her down, gave nil, nil points. Uh, for, for that disability. When I represented the lady at appeal, uh, the, uh, G, one of the GP in the panel was disgusted, absolutely shocked, couldn't believe that this level of medical evidence and knowledge was set aside. And it would seem that some of the uh, very energetic members of ATOS in, in their attempt to refuse people... Uh, I will, yes. I understand what you're saying, but I do find it rather strange. Uh, given that it was your minister uh, that uh, introduced the legislation that brought ACOS into power, uh, that, that when they were appointed, there were, it was privatisation of uh, medical support services. And that in the first year, from June 11 to 2012, 13,740 claimants were removed by ACOS, sort of thing. But it was your minister that brought it in. And you're just on here today, crying crocodile tears. Well, uh, uh, I, I don't see any crocodile tears in evidence. I'm merely stating fact. And I don't think that uh, my colleague uh, sent out a job description for all uh, uh, healthcare professionals to apply who will disregard the evidence, who will turn uh, people down. We uh, certainly acknowledge uh, the fact that it is a job of work that requires uh, to be done uh, and that uh, we expect the highest professional staff. Standards. And, and the, the SDLP has not in any shape or form defended uh, the track record of ATOS and I believe the contract is now awarded uh, to Capita. And I think uh, given uh, that uh, Mr McCann's uh, blushes are going to be saved somewhat later today when he goes through whatever lobby he chooses to go through by the petition of concern by the DUP, I think you have more questions to ask of your party colleagues. Uh, but the system has always been that people represent uh, 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 
put forward medical evidence. We're asking also that there be uh, an acknowledgement of mental ill health evidence because I have represented people at appeal, uh, Mr. Speaker, who have chronic and enduring mental health conditions for which there is no <coughs> cure, but a, a management regime which usually involves medication. And uh, I, I do believe that greater cognizance and a greater onus of responsibility should be placed on those assessors. I mean, some of them behave as, they're, uh, as if they're the, um, the red coats that run around doing parking tickets, as if they're in some sort of uh, reward voucher scheme uh, for turning people down. I think over 40% of appeals have uh, been won. So, Mr. Speaker, people are talking about the costs. If, if we get it right, put the right people in to do the right assessments, to get the right outcome, costs can be reduced in terms of the appeals. And people, more importantly, the people who are at the other end of that appeal don't have to suffer the stress and anxiety and indeed the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the experience of having to go for appeal. The number of people who have had to take a side to uh, enable them to dry their tears before they even go into the appeal uh, uh, is very humbling, Mr Speaker. It is not uh, uh, an occasion that anyone looks forward to and we should not be robbing people of their basic human dignity in such ways. We should be there to support. That's a welfare reform. The welfare state was created. It was actually to, to give human dignity to people, to put people at the centre of a society where people are treated more fairly and equally, not to reduce them to snivelling wrecks as they go into an appeal, to give that which is rightly their due. Uh, so, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, that's why we are looking for tighter, but if the Minister has something to say, we'll listen carefully again uh, to what he has to say. Amendment 12, Mr Speaker, is, is given uh, uh, to look at, uh, as Mr Beggs referred to, around uh, the victims of hate incidents in, in some leeway in observing claimant commitment. And we have looked uh, particularly at domestic violence in relation to that. And only yesterday, uh, Mr Speaker, I had a case uh, of, a per, uh, of a person who is a victim of domestic violence having to go for repeat ESA interviews. And I have advised them you know, that there is already, I understood, a previous commitment from um, uh, Mr. Minister Storey's predecessor in relation to the victims of domestic violence. And given the huge rise in domestic violence incidents uh, that are coming uh, to the attention of our police service, then it is something that this House should address and take seriously in, in relation to uh, the needs of, uh, of that vulnerable group in particular. So uh, I would ask uh, members to think carefully. I would also ask uh, if this is not something that can uh, uh, be a subject to a petition of concern. You know, I, I think that would be a very good statement by this House in relation to our commitment uh, to those people who uh, suffer uh, from such attacks. And might I remind members that for a person to come forward for help uh, to the police or to make a complaint, it's usually how they have suffered a minimum of 35 incidents of attack or assault before they seek help. So we are talking to people in crisis at a, a very vulnerable time in their life. So I'd ask members to reflect carefully on that. Amendment uh, 13 uh, deals on a, a similar basis. And then Amendment 17, we're asking uh, the Department to bring a replacement for the Independent Living Fund within 18 months of commencement of this bill. I note uh, Mr Begg's earlier comments in relation to uh, commitments that my colleague Mr Ramsey got, and he will address this particular amendment uh, later on. Uh, uh, I think he had uh, some discussions with the Health Minister in relation to, to this, so uh, we will uh, check that out, and indeed Mr Ramsey will hopefully uh, inform the House of just where that uh, commitment is at and how satisfied he is uh, by uh, what the Minister said. Uh, again, Amendment uh, 19 is dealing with uh, evidence of mental ill health. And as a society coming out of conflict, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, I think there has to be recognition uh, that uh, the instances of mental ill health are on the rise. Uh, people are suffering, I think, uh, a lot of um, workplace uh, absenteeism is now uh, noted as uh, because of stress and anxiety. So mental ill health is a cause of concern uh, to, uh, to me and hopefully to uh, this House. Uh, but in relation in particular to uh, victims, and I know I touch on that in, in another amendment, uh, that uh, one of the uh, difficulties uh, in terms of some of the families I've represented who have been victims of the conflict is having to relive 
and open their wounds again as they have to tell another person why they should get support. And it really is an, uh, opening up that very emotive raw state for them. And that is one of the reasons that we want uh, some sensitivity in the, in the department and uh, in relation to uh, these amendments. Uh, as a former occupational therapist working in the psychiatric unit, uh, Mr. Speaker, I recall very vividly uh, one of our senior psychiatrists at that time saying that, and, and this is uh, too long ago, this is about uh, uh, 14 years ago, she then said about the numbers that were presenting at that time um, with mental ill health as a consequence of the troubles. So we're only starting to see that pattern emerge, and her words were very prophetic at that time. Uh, and, uh, and I think that has been on the increase. And you have to look across uh, to young people in particular uh, uh, in relation to the level of suicide. So we do have to take proper recognition of mental ill health. It is not something that somebody glibly puts down who wants to be pigeonholed. And I do hope uh, that the department does take greater awareness and, and cognizance of uh, any medical evidence in relation to uh, mental ill health. Amendment 36 is similar uh, and deals with the same subject as uh, Amendment uh, 19. Uh, we we uh, will want to hear uh, carefully and closely the, uh, from Mr Agnew in relation to Amendments 37, 38 and 39 in relation to uh, the assessments and, and why he believes it should be carried out by a trust or a GP, and we have heard other members say that they, that, that they already will be, that it might be some sort of uh, uh, um, agreement with the various trusts in relation to the release of some of their healthcare professionals. But I do, uh, I do uh, believe that Mr Agnew, uh, in, in speaking to him yesterday, that some of the intent uh, was around uh, accountability. And I look forward to hear further from him during the course of uh, today's debate. Uh, again, um, we, I met with uh, Mr. Agnew yesterday and in relation to am amendments 43. Uh, and 44, but in relation to 43, it's uh, cash in its broadest terms, it's around the bank gyro cheque, it's around the post office account, and we all know that, how, uh, that uh, there has been a crackdown by the banks in uh, people opening accounts and moving money about and giving greater e explanation uh, to uh, their bank, and I think a minimum requirement is indeed two utility bills. And for people who find themselves homeless or, member, uh, or living in sheltered or hostel type accommodation, this proves a particularly onerous task. And I, I, I believe that uh, Mr. Agnew will refer further uh, to that. And it's one that we would be minded to support at this time uh, in relation to the difficulties that people uh, find themselves in in relation to opening of bank accounts. And uh, Amendment 44 uh, and uh, 45, again, uh, we will listen carefully to the contribution uh, to Mr. Agnew and, uh, of Mr. Agnew and see uh, what the policy intent is uh, uh, behind uh, those uh, amendments. So then we look to uh, Amendment uh, 53. And that is the particular one uh, that I referred to a few moments ago, Mr. Speaker, in relation to uh, taking account of victims and survivors of the past. Uh, we have, over many years, given various commitments as a society to the victims of the conflict, and sadly, not very many of them have yet uh, materialised. Mr Speaker, I do think this would be an important statement by this House that uh, there is special recognition given by this Assembly to people who continue to suffer the trauma of uh, the past. So again, I would uh, ask uh, the DUP not to deploy the, the petition of concern in relation uh, to this particular clause. Ask them to not to deploy it, Mr Speaker, <laughs> against any of the clauses, but in particular, uh, I would ask uh, for some recognition addition to be given of the sensitivities in relation to this particular clause. Amendments 57 and 74, Mr Agnew, uh, then again, uh, as a party, we give a commitment to hear uh, Mr Agnew on the matter. Uh, that, uh, Mr Speaker, um, ends my contribution in relation to uh, the Group 1 set of amendments. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as a party, we have uh, shown uh, responsibility, we have shown concern to the most vulnerable, and we have uh, done what we said we would do in relation to the tabling of these amendments. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, 
may I just take a, some time to, to, to welcome the uh, long-awaited return of, of this welfare reform bill to the House, two long years after its original introduction. In that intervening period, we have had nothing but crisis and deep anxiety across the community over this key piece of legislation. Crisis from an executive seemingly failing to reach agreement, putting the power-sharing institutions at risk of collapse and at not insubstantial cost to this community, and in this particular aspect, certainly in excess of £100 million. An anxiety, Mr. Speaker, pervasive and unwarranted anxiety amongst the people that we represent, many the most vulnerable in our society as the result of scaremongering. It is for those two reasons that I commend the agreement reached at Stormont Castle and Stormont House uh, in respect of, of uh, moving this key piece of legislation forward. It is time, Mr. Speaker to end the crisis and anxiety and to implement the welfare reform alongside the concessions and the mitigation measures won and agreed. Agreed mitigation measures. Yet one would wonder today, listening to some of the debate, whether anybody was ever at the game at all when the agreement was being made. These concessions will protect the most vulnerable from the most unjust and harshest measures passed by Westminster by a Conservative-led government. And for the record, and for Mr Nesbitt, I am not, nor have ever been, a member of the Liberal Democratic Party. I am a proud member of the Alliance Party. Those are the two feet that I am standing on in this chamber. Mr Speaker, what I would also wish to state for the record is that our Member of Parliament sits in opposition to that Conservative sure. government at <laughs> Westminster. She sits in opposition to that, and she voted in opposition to uh, that legislation. Alliance considers that Stormont House Agreement was a reasonable and honourable attempt to reach compromise. It was a five-party agreement unless I hear disagreement in the chamber today. And we expect to see that the whole agreement is put in, in place. It is an entire process, and it is important that it is put back on track. Some of the agreement was made behind closed doors, and I accept and understand that. But the exceptional nature of the problems which are faced required exceptional responses. As a result, I have to today call out the cynical attempts of some of those using this legislation to do nothing but electioneer. Those who nodded this compromise through when the agreement was made. Those who have now decided to play politics in order to gain what they see as an electorate advantage or a chance to perhaps launch a personal political ambitions. Maybe there are a few leadership um, bids underway in this chamber. Mr. Speaker, I wish to place on record my and my party's dislike of the unilateral use of petitions of concern, and that particularly by the DUP. Using a petition of concern as a negotiating tactic is not what they were used for or intended for, and I do consider them unacceptable. Such actions could ultimately unravel the agreement and these hard-won concessions, which neither Scotland nor Wales have been able to secure, but nevertheless I recognise the contribution uh, of uh, others in this debate and those who were not party to the Stormont Castle or Stormont House agreement. And therefore, I have some sympathy with those uh, proposals made by Mr Agnew, and I will listen to what he has to say. But I think a great deal of the amendments that are proposed here today can and will be dealt with by the Minister in his response to the House. But it is important that every single one of them is costed. On the amendments, the Alliance Party will honour the Stormont House Agreement. We made an agreement, we are an honourable party, and we will stick to our agreements. We can and will today support those amendments that are agreed, because to do otherwise would be, un would be to undermine an agreement that all the party leaders accepted and signed up to. We would also point out that many of the amendments relate to making regulatory powers for things which are already done or will be soon done. 
We are sympathetic to many of these amendments, but we expect that the Minister will allow all party input into those amendments through regulations coming to the Committee. We will listen to what he has to say. For Alliance, implementing this legislation in a way that protects the vulnerable does not stop, and does not stop the legislation. We will do so while the regulations are produced. Can I turn to the Group 1 uh, 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 amendments that are proposed? And turning specifically to the proposed amendments pertaining uh, to the Department and the Administration and Assessments. During the committee stage of this bill, the frequency of payments was often cited by those in the social sector as a serious cause of concern. The proposed monthly payment arrangements as implemented in the rest of the UK would likely cause undue budgeting pressures on the most vulnerable in society. The Department has taken this on board and will implement a default fortnightly payment schedule for welfare recipients. Our requirement is therefore not necessarily part of the bill and contradicts the mechanisms agreed by the executive parties. I am satisfied that progress has been made on this issue. With regard to Amendment 12, the Alliance Party has been one of the strongest proponents of the more comprehensive support for people affected by hate crime. Sadly, hate crime is on the rise in Northern Ireland and has a serious and pervasive effect on the lives of those affected and their families. And many, many require rehousing and a period of recovery. Therefore, measures to accommodate hate crime victims in our welfare system are not only appropriate and just, it is important that we avoid further trauma as a result of welfare sanctions. The Department has indicated that such mechanisms will exist through good cause a clause contained within the bill. I am content to support this. However, I think it is only appropriate that we keep the operation of this under close scrutiny to ensure if its functions, it functions as intended and supports victims through their period of recovery. Another issue uh, repeatedly highlighted in regards to welfare reform in the rest of the UK is the need for a solid medical basis on which to make assessments. Therefore, we will support the agreed amendment made by the Ulster Unions, number 35, in this regard. This will ensure that the relevant medical evidence is taken into account when assessing a person's ability to carry out daily living or mobility activities. However, this does, not, this does raise the question, how is the medical evidence obtained? At what cost and how qualified is the assessor in interpreting the medical documentation? These questions, I believe, are yet to be fully answered, but I do think will be dealt with through regulation. To ensure a system that is fit for purpose, however, I do call upon the Minister and the Committee to investigate these issues in depth and to ensure appropriate and fair measures are put in place. Mr. Speaker, concluding on this section, I, wish to, I think that it is vital to highlight the mitigation measures in regards to such issues that have been agreed with Treasury. Anything else that is uncosted is not uh, likely uh, to proceed in this House today and would cause a further burden on an, al on an already overstressed and stretched budget. Furthermore, the terms of agreement are much more favourable than those presented in the rest of the United Kingdom. We must uh, um, support the structures as agreed or face losing these concessions and return to the crisis and anxiety and inaction the previous two years. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The Business Committee is arranged to meet immediately after lunchtime suspension today, and I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until 2 p.m. The first item of business when we return will be question time. Thank you.